this clip, courtesy of Tim Dillon's podcast, that kind of enraged me, right? And I feel like it, it enraging me is probably a good sign that I should be trying to chase the things I want to do in terms of my career and one of what I actually want to do in my kind of everyday life, right? I shouldn't be, um, I shouldn't be trying to, what do you call it? I shouldn't be trying to, um, what well, someone said in the chat, was that a strange unit? Random and off topic, any advice for aspiring brand new rookie DJ? I think I mentioned it before, maybe I've got a video coming out about it before. There is no advice really to give. I think when it comes to DJing, similar to like stand-up comedy and shit, you just have to go out and do the thing. You have to go out and practice a lot. You have to practice a lot, make lots of mixes, record yourself playing, um, take those video clip, take that video of you recorded um, playing, cut it up into clips, upload that onto your Instagram, make a maybe separate DJ Instagram, share that around places, comment in different places, you know, immerse yourself in the community, maybe go on Reddit and start getting involved in there, start commenting on people's posts, whatever it may be, like just try and get your name out there, email loads of clubs that you think you want to play at and send them like your mixes and demos. It's just a standard things you heard. There is no cheat code um, and there is no kind of um, path to follow. It's just the common things and then you don't know what's going to hit. You may be, it may be a stream that hits. You might end up emailing someone, you get lucky. You might end up going to a party and bumping into somebody. You don't know what's going to hit for you. But the, the only advice I'd say is just keep mixing, keep playing, keep recording, keep uploading, keep sharing. There is no cheat. There is no um, cut, shortcut in this shit. You just have to keep going with it. And I think I've kind of come to that realization myself, to be honest. There are, there are no cheat codes. There are no shortcuts around it. It's just a whole bunch of work. And sometimes it may not even pay off. That's a really crucial thing that a lot of these guys don't talk about. They'll say, oh yeah, you should start your thing, do your podcast, start your fucking business, making fucking homemade furniture and shit. But what they don't tell you is that it may not work out, but that's not the problem. The point isn't it working out. The point is you chasing your dream. That's the main thing. The fact that you chased it, and even if it doesn't work out, you've still got a fucking cool story to fucking tell someone at the bar. Oh, I invested a bunch of money in a restaurant. It didn't work out. I was fucking a useless boss. I tried to make this whiskey thing. I tried to make a book, whatever it may be called. You've got an interesting story to tell. I think that's always an interesting part. And obviously you've lived the life worth living too because you chased a dream and you haven't gone to your grave regretting things. So forget trying to make it, have fun, do as much as you can. And if you do end up making it along the way, you're Gucci, man. You're Gucci, all right? Anyway, back to the show. So this thing on Tim Dillon really intrigued me and really kind of pissed me off and kind of showed me everything I kind of needed. <laughs> Luke from Zinger Rockhold. Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you, Mo. Luke Rockhold. <laughs> Luke Zinger Rockhold. That's hilarious. <laughs> Luke just be saying shit, right? Luke just be saying stuff, going around in circles, not really making points. Anyway, go fuck yourself. Anyway, continue. So, um, <laughs> this this story, this uh, post, this story, this clip, okay, taken from Tinder, this podcast, really funny, interesting, with Paul Verzi, where they kind of speak about um, how reckless they were when it came to fucking COVID and how they weren't taking the restrictions seriously and how just living their lives. It fucking pissed me off because there's a lot of revision, revisionist history in this because now, you know, we're post-COVID now. People don't care about restrictions. People have maybe, you know, eyes have opened in terms of... Um, uh, what the truth is behind all the preventative stuff we were doing in terms of wearing masks and wiping down our groceries and social distancing and lockdowns. We're all kind of more aware of the situation, right? And the uh, CDC isn't as powerful as a force in our lives anymore. No one talks about fucking Fauci anymore. All that's good shit. So maybe it's different. But let's still remember these fucking stand-up comedians, right? These fucking cunts, for some reason, at the peak of COVID, legitimately thought, right, that we were desperate to see them perform on stage to the point where they were going out on tour, flouting all the rules, putting people into places, spreading COVID all around places. You know what I mean, in a, indirectly killing probably a bunch of fucking people. Imagine the amount of bodies they must have on their on their hands, right? Let alone the victims of any kind of other assault that they may have on their books. They've all got all these fucking bodies off the back of COVID. And they legitimately thought that they were like crucial parts of the economy that they had to be on the stage doing what they're doing. It's really an incredible um, example of hubris, an incredible example of fucking arrogance to, to think that you are that crucial. And again, this is, remember, this is peak COVID. This is COVID when we didn't know what was going on. We were seeing all those videos of people in China getting thrown into fucking um, um, tobacco, like freezers and shit and van, people's door. I remember there was a video I saw once of this kind of um, building, it's a apartment block somewhere 
Obama where these um, Chinese health officials were going around with tape and literally boarding people up in their fucking houses. Like insane, taping them up, sorry, in their houses and stuff. There were drones going around telling people to stay inside. People getting sprayed down with fucking antibacterial spray that they were a fucking piece of machinery. It was absolutely crazy. So at that time, these motherfuckers literally thought, no, I have to get on the stage and tell my fucking shitty dick joke. That's the most important thing. And now they're trying to laugh and joke about it. So it fucking enraged me. It really did. But let's continue. This is the video clip. So it's to Tim Dillon and Paul Versey, episode number 314. Thankful about that's that. That's awesome. Check about it out, it. man. Yeah. It's getting great reviews, and I'm really happy. I, I was working hard, and luckily I got COVID early. Yeah. Because getting COVID, you got COVID like dude, you I were got, like patient zero. Dude, I I joked. I said I got COVID like I was waiting for an album to drop. Like right. I was online at midnight for PlayStation. 5. Yeah. I got COVID. And then you just basically like coasted for the next two years, like unafraid. And and yeah yeah. And then you were happened? like you were like uh, immunity. Who gives a fuck? Well yeah. And then five months after, when the world was shut down, yeah. I was like, all right, now let's go to the states that really don't. Don't have don't believe in COVID, right? So yeah, went, they so, and that's what we did. Uh, yeah, we 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 went on tour that whole time. I wonder, to be honest with you, I wonder in our lifetimes yeah. if there will ever be a more interesting time to do stand up than when we did it, like during that era. And I think me, you, Brett Ernst, yeah. and maybe a couple of other people were out, out. Like, like yeah, we were out. No, no, like I was like people were yeah. like, dude, are you tour? Like, no, is this your tour? We were out like it wasn't <laughs> happening. <laughs> yeah, we were out that like we were, it didn't uh, exist. Yeah, we were out. I was in Texas. I was in Arizona. All those places. Hundred. And again, most of it. Let's be honest. Most of it was greed. Most of it was just they wanted the money and they liked the attention. Because I think, to be fair to them as well, let's be fair to the current comedians, right? If you spend your entire career building yourself up to a point where you're able to get booked in certain places, people come to see you, they buy tickets and shit, and you essentially get all these dopamine hits of like performing on the stage in front of a live crowd every single weekend, sometimes five days a week, sometimes six days a week if, you, if you're really diligent, it can be hard to kind of let it go. It can be difficult, especially when people are telling you to let it go, especially if you're not sure about the virus, especially if you're skeptical, especially if you're a cynic, all these sort of things. So I get it, especially if you're, an, and again, being a grown up adult and you've got that kind of attention, it's probably hard to kind of turn it down. But a lot of these guys, especially the main guys they mentioned, not, not maybe the other guys you mentioned, but some of the other guys who were going on tour, they were, they all had successful podcasts. They were making, you know, decent amounts of money online and shit. I wouldn't say there was no need to go on tour, but it wasn't like they were down to like nothing. I mean, they had the ability to make some money, um, but still, you know, it wasn't enough, needed more. So it was definitely more of sort of a greed thing, in my opinion. Less sort of like, oh, I need to express myself. I've got this burning desire to tell jokes. It's like, no, 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 no. You just wanted to collect the coins. It is what it is, but let's be honest. And, and I was doing it every week. Yeah. And some comics were like, I see the, I mean, obviously, I don't think they were talking about who, I don't know who they're talking about. Right. But yeah, these comics who have like full schedules, like, yeah, that's yeah. responsible. And it's like, yeah. nobody's booking you. Right, you're not giving up anything. You're not. You're well, like, no, no. There was, there was. That's funny, but there were some people who legitimately did give up bookings because they didn't feel like it's responsible to go out and tour in the middle of a fucking global pandemic. And I guess this is the point where you just, you just kind of wonder for society in it because these kind of people, there's never going to be a pandemic for them, especially now. Most people who are kind of skeptical, there's never going to be a pandemic that they're going to ever take seriously because of how fucked up and how dodgy the whole COVID thing was dealt with, right? But in general, they don't really take it seriously anyway because they always kind of look after number one. It's quite selfish. And there's no, there is no um, um, altruism involved there, right? There is no, um, uh, there is no, yeah, there is no kind of a thinking about your fellow man. There is no greater good. It's just me and myself and my family, which is probably why COVID lasted as long as it did because especially parts in Western Europe, especially here in the UK, we had the same sort of thing. People couldn't band together and kind of agree on one thing because fundamentally people disagreed on the very nature of the virus. What did it exist? Was it real? Do you remember the early parts of COVID when people were fucking making, especially Black Twitter, I don't know why, on Black Twitter there was, there was this movement where people were making um, broths with like lemons and like apples and shit to drink so you could avoid getting COVID. Do you remember that? That was a big thing. There was a half of the population that were wiping down their groceries. Half the population weren't leaving their houses. Half the population were wearing those fucking stupid screens in front of their faces, those plastic screens, as if that was going to do anything. Like people were wearing rubber gloves when they were going to shop and stuff. It was like so bizarre, right? So there were people that were literally raw dogging prostitutes in the streets, and then there were people who were wearing rubber gloves and shields on in their face. You know I mean, you're never going to get them to agree. So it's what it is. Callan, I have Callan and Shaw went out early, and they got sick. 
Yeah. And then they had to post, hey, if you shook my hand in the meet and greet. And that was funny because it's like, wait, you did a fucking meet and greet? <laughs> like, that was like, that was like the next level of like, wait a minute, what? And you know what's funny? That's true. Because at the time when Brendan and Brian were going out touring, I don't think any of us were under any sort of illusion that other comedians were doing it. They were just a bit more smarter. They weren't posting it. They weren't fucking doing stories about their tour. But, you know, those guys are addicted to the fucking attention and the likes and the tweets and whatnot, especially Brendan, who says he doesn't really comment. But they weren't doing what I saw. They were just going to, they were going to flipping comedy club and just performing and then leaving. But they were making sure they were collecting their money to, you know, make sure their family is fed and shit and they got roof over their heads. But those guys did the, the extra step. They did shows in COVID. They promoted them super hard. They spread COVID all around the place. And then they also did meet and greets during a peak pandemic. Peak pandemic. Again, this is not people... Think, remember, this is not like 2021 pandemic. This is like 2020. Like maybe like early... Yeah, early 2020, late 2019 kind of pandemic times where everyone's nervous and scared. These guys are doing fucking meet and greets. Like, shit. So yeah. that made a lot of people start going like, what the fuck? <laughs> You're, you're doing comedy and you're doing a meet and greet. But it was like, listen, the way I looked at it was like this. Listen, I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I've done comedy now. I started in like 2010, like late 2010. So I was like, listen, I'm doing it a very long time. You're 13 years in. 13 years in. Wow. I was like, I finally have some people that want to come see me. Yeah. I've been on the road a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm taking every precaution. And just knowing a little bit about viruses you knew basically come on say it to me say it. you just wanted the money that's why i like this guy because he's honest he's usually quite self-aware come on just say it you worked really hard you busted your ass to have a career you finally got some traction and you weren't about to let some fucking chinese virus put a pause on your trajectory to keep continuing making that money to sharpening your skills and performing just be honest come on and the money was good come on just say it you know this wasn't your there was no way yeah. this was going to be preventable no. if i mean it, people are gonna get it yeah people are gonna get it you know what i don't like though now tim yeah is that now they're coming out going the truth is yeah the real truth is right if it wasn't an n95 mask it kind of didn't yeah like, like, like right. if you had a cloak that's dumb, though, because we always knew that. I don't know if Americans didn't know that, but it was a common thing here in the UK. Everyone knew that N95 mask or the other one, was it K90-something? Those are the only ones that actually would stop you from getting COVID. But the idea behind the other mask, the kind of face mask or the whatever, if you wore like a snood, it was just a, a some level of protection. It wouldn't stop anything potentially, but... That's the thing I never really understood about COVID. Again, I don't want to go over COVID talk because it's fucking boring. But I never understood why the people who were against the COVID measures, like the the, the mask and the physical distancing and all that shit, they wouldn't do it just because it wasn't like a full, it wasn't a hundred percent foolproof. It didn't, it wasn't hundred, it didn't offer hundred percent protection. Just because a face mask doesn't offer percent protection doesn't mean you don't do it. It's going to offer some protection. Do you know what I mean? It's, I don't know, but maybe, maybe again, it's, it wasn't their fault. Maybe it's just always the messaging around COVID. Because I think some people sold it as like, if you wear a mask, you're never going to get it, which is obviously not true. Um, but what a, we're going to look back around that whole time and just think, oh, what were we thinking, man? What were we thinking? What were we thinking? Cloth mask. It was fake. It was fake. And it's yeah. Fake. <laughs> well, remember the yeah. hand sanitizer? Remember all the things we did, wiping down packages, all that shit? And then we realized, oh, none of that worked. That's not how it spread. We don't have to d fucking wipe yeah. down yeah. all of this shit. No, no, no. The thing, I think similar to what someone said here, um, Yeti Machete says, and K95 only work if everyone's wearing them. This is what he's saying also, which I think. These measures only work if everyone's doing them. If everyone else is, it's like that, what's that adage? Um, that common adage of like, if I sweep my front garden leaves, then maybe my neighbor will see me doing it and then he'll sweep theirs, theirs too. But if you go around each person's house and start saying sweep their leaves, no one's going to do it. So you have to kind of lead by example, help people follow your example too. So back in pandemic times, if everybody was wiping down their groceries, if everybody wore a mask, if everybody was doing face, physical distancing, if everybody avoided crowds, maybe we would have got over it quicker. But to get everyone to agree to those kind of things was always impossible, which is why I thought lockdowns were fucking dumb because not everyone's going to stay indoors. Some people are just going to go outdoors. Do you know what I mean? That's what I never understood. Like, unless you're going to do fucking full on China um, monitoring and fucking communism, you're never, ever, ever going to get people to stop going outside. It's never going to happen. <laughs> you don't have to take out fucking 
ethyl alcohol and spray down. It doesn't pan, affect food. Yeah, Panda Express yeah. fucking to-go boxes. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. We didn't have to do any of that. Nobody, <laughs> it was insane. But we, we were out there, and I remember doing stand-up the week before the election. And, I, and it was, uh, it okay. was November. And okay. it was the week before the election. And I remember it was, we had the pandemic and the election. And I remember saying to my opener, we were sitting in the back in the green room. And I said, and then Trump, I believe had gone, he had just got COVID. I think you were in Nashville. Yeah. And he was getting flown in a helicopter. Yeah. And, and I don't know yeah. when this was, it was maybe, it was October. Yeah. It, it was, was close to October. the election. Yeah. Yeah. And I said to my opener, I'm like, we could find out the president is dead in the middle of the show. I'm like, we don't know what's going on. I'm like, the president of the United States, yeah, who's in his 70s, yeah. has COVID. Yeah, that's true. He, who's overweight, in his 70s, has COVID, and we are sitting in the back of, I, I don't know if it was Stand Up Live in Phoenix. I don't know where I was, but I said, we're like close to an election. I'm like, there's never been a crazier time in my memory to do stand-up comedy than this period now it you know what's funny too about that time too if i remember correctly i want to get up on the screen here don't i think some americans what might agree don't you guys remember when donald trump got covid how many people were secretly heard wishing he died do you remember that that was like a thing like people were literally wishing he would die <laughs> Because if I remember correctly, I think it was similar to when Boris Johnson here in the UK, our Prime Minister, when Boris Johnson got COVID, it was basically um it was they were getting briefed in the news that there may be a change in kind of, you know, leadership. And they were obviously briefing the party like he might pass away because at that time Boris Johnson was really fat and overweight and he had all the kind of markers of somebody that could potentially die from COVID and he was on like death's door. And I think the story is the same with Trump. Trump was actually on death's door, like he was close um, because of how unhealthy he is and whatever it may be. So there was clearly some worries that he could pass away. But I remember it being a big thing that they were, people were pushing. Not, not pushing, there was this kind of weird um, kind of, thing that people were doing with all kind of like yeah if he dies it's good because he wasn't taking covid seriously do you guys remember that that was a thing but what i remember was him coming back on the balcony was it trump covid let's see if i can get up on it trump covid balcony that i remember the best that was what i remember the best you guys remember that that legitimately was one of the most blockbuster things i've ever seen in my entire life when he flew back on Air Force One, or is it Air Force One? What's that, that helicopter you guys have where the presidents go in? He flew back from the hospital, right? Like triumphantly came back, stepped out onto that balcony <laughs> and ripped off his mask. Do you remember? That was like box office TV, man. Like legitimately box office TV. Like this guy is like an awful, awful president, awful leader, you know, terrible politician. Maybe he's a good politician, actually, because of how maybe he sticks up to the opposition. I don't really know. But just in general, not the best leader in the world. Doesn't really inspire confidence, right? Maybe someone that causes more division and bring, brings people together. When it comes to providing box office on TV, there's nothing better than that. Literally nothing better than a prime minister, a president, sorry, who kind of flouted all the COVID restrictions, said it wasn't real, and then got COVID, and then said, I'm not dead. I'm not dead. It was never given dead comes back on his helicopter and rips off his markers on the fucking, on the fucking um, White House uh, balcony with the flags behind him and shit, standing proud, defiant, breathing in the air. And I remember the time when I remember reading it, or I remember seeing it live on TV when it happened. Maybe I can get a video of it, actually, where he comes back. Is there a video of it? I don't know if there is a video of it. There might be one. Where he comes back on the thing. And I remember him, like, he's like... <sighs> He's like weirdly breathing too when he comes back on it too, if I remember correctly. It was like, it wasn't even, he didn't look that great. He was kind of labored in his breathing. <laughs> Honestly, legitimately one of the most craziest times in the world. This is, this is the CNN thing, right? Obviously, this is kind of Trump's favorite, right? CNN, fake news, fake news, fake news. Let's see if it works. Probably going to be a report of someone chatting shit. But I, just, I did enjoy him being on the balcony, just ripping that mask off. It was fucking crazy. Because it was literally like he was an undertaker. He came back from the dead like he went, mm. it was never given dead. Come on, load, you cunt, or I'm going to move on. Okay, I'm going to move on. I don't give a fuck. You know what I mean anyway. I'm sure you must have seen the video.